And it is 6 p.m. on the West Coast, so let's kick off uh, the Thursday, October 6th edition of the Vancouver Power BI and Modern Excel User Group Meetup. Uh, I am your host, Ken Pulse. Um, I did discover, actually, uh, just a little while ago, we were playing around in the earlier chat window. Um, on the More menu inside your things, there is actually um, the ability to turn on live captions. Uh, that happens on your side, so it's something that you can control. And if you like to have the closed captioning to see what Microsoft thinks I'm saying, um, it could be highly entertaining, could be distracting as well. So, you know, get your mile or your money out of it uh, either way. Uh, of course, this meetup is being recorded. So if you uh, are feeling shy or don't want to have to or have anything on camera, please, uh, you know, keep your camera um, visual off and uh, you can always just type in the chat. Um, and I am watching the chat as we uh, as we go along here. So um, no need to uh, say anything if you'd prefer not to be recorded. Um, the agenda for today, uh, we are at the welcome and overview section. Uh, we'll be into the feature presentation in approximately five minutes. And then I'm going to talk for about an hour ish, depending on what kind of questions you all ask me and how carried away I get talking about my tools here. Um, so before we jump into uh, into that, I just want to throw out a big thanks to the sponsors that make all of this stuff happen. Uh, Skillwave is uh, the training division of Excel Guru um, that I run in conjunction with Matt Allington, uh, where we have some fantastic training on Power Query and Power Pivot and Power BI and all kinds of good stuff there. Um, we are also, uh, this is sponsored, of course, by Excel Guru, which is my company, which happens to be the company that uh, builds and um, sells monkey tools, which is going to be the subject of today's meeting. Uh, Devisha, I see that comment on the Power Query Academy. Love it. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, all right, our next meetups that we have coming up here, uh, the Power BI track, please note that we have a later than normal start time. We will be starting at 9 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, this is because we've got Chandeep Chabra who's going to be joining us uh, from, I, I believe Chandeep said he's actually in Dubai, um, and he's going to be showing us some M tricks in Power Query, so I'm uh, very much looking forward to that. And then come November, we've got uh, Melissa DeCortez coming back, and that's going to be our regular 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, and Melissa is going to be showing us some cool uh, Power Query uh, stuff as well. Um, and if you had the chance to, uh, to come to Melissa's presentation last time, everybody really enjoyed it. So very much looking forward to that as well. Uh, I do want to throw out just a quick note um, of a couple of the courses that I'm running right now. We have a new semester of my Excel Fundamentals Boot Camp, which is kicking off on October 19th. Uh, this is a program which is pitched at um, increasing the core skills for the Excel analysts, things like formulas, pivot tables, data visualization, and power query. Um, it has live interaction and coaching, video uh, video uh, material and whatnot. Uh, this is ideal for people that are uh, want to learn pivot tables and increase their formula and reporting skills. Uh, it may not be you, could be someone uh, you know, though, if you're interested, as I say, our last semester of the year is kicking off on October 19th. In addition to that, um, we have a new uh, semester of the Self-Service BI Bootcamp. I mean, this is our premier program that we actually run for uh, training package for pivot table users that want to level up their game with Power Query, Power Pivot, and Power BI. Um, if you are interested in this, we have a new semester that is kicking off on October 19th as well. Super excited. Once again, the last semester of the year, uh, but you do get a year's access to all this stuff. Or if you are interested in doing this kind of thing in person, um, thank you, Melinda. I appreciate the, uh, the great course comment. Melinda actually joined me in Toronto for the live version, which we're actually going to be doing in Auckland, New Zealand, November 30th through December 2nd. So if you happen to be in New Zealand or need a good excuse to go to New Zealand, um, this is going to actually be right now we actually have a small number of registrants going to be a very up close and personal course great uh, great access to myself there um, plus you get access to all of the online version of the self-service bi bootcamp for a year as well so there's no better way to experience this first you get the uh, the in person and then uh, you know the live interaction uh, afterwards through our ask me anything session so if you're interested uh, check it out at the definity link uh, down on the, below there all of these links are in the slide deck that has been uploaded to the meetup site uh, of course, all of these meetups get recorded and hosted on our SkillWave YouTube channel. The link is uh, shown in the bottom right-hand corner. Again, is posted in the slide deck on the meetup site as well. And that recording should be up within 24 to 48 hours, depending on exactly how long it takes me to, uh, to go through and get it produced. 
I, I do want to throw a quick shout out to some of the free content that we put out there. Um, one of the topics uh, that uh, I'm actually super excited about on this one here is I just uh, posted for this week, the solving many to many joins using bridge tables. Uh, this is actually one of the techniques that we teach in the self-service BI bootcamp, um, but you can actually get access to it in under three minutes uh, at the SkillWave YouTube channel. And uh, and last thing I want to say is if you are interested in speaking, we are looking for speakers for our 2023 lineup. I am looking for people that will speak about anything to do with Power Query, Power Pivot, Excel, Power BI. If you're interested and want to try your hands out in one of these uh, meetup groups, please fill out the survey at xlguru.ca slash speak at Vanpug, and we will get in touch and we would love to have you on. We always love having new speakers uh, come in as well. Um, awesome. All right. So. That is the intro portion. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and switch decks here, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we're here to talk about today. So bear with me as I accidentally hit completely the wrong button. I do not want to try and do that in Teams. I want to hit the from current slide button. Here we go. So what I am going to be uh, talking about today is uh, building better Excel models faster, uh, otherwise known as building Excel BI models with monkey tools. And uh, the concept or the, the uh, discussion that we're gonna be looking at here specifically is how the software that I've written can actually help speed up this game uh, working with Excel BI models. Before we do that though, um, what I would like to do is I'd like to just uh, survey all of you really quickly here. So let me just share this and, uh, Oh, hang on a second. It's not that one. It's present. There we go. I'm getting used to this particular software. So if you can fill out the uh, the little survey here, uh, basically what you can do is you can uh, you can go to uh, uh, menti.com and just uh, type in that uh, that little number there, and it should take you into the survey that uh, that I actually had there. Um, so seven seven eight five two three four six, or just scan the QR code. Hopefully everybody's got that. But I'm just going to drop the uh, number into the chat as well. There we go. And I'm just a little curious on how much experience people have here uh, working with this stuff. Uh, how many people do we have here? About 20 people in the meetup right now. Okay, cool. And uh, it looks like uh, nobody's got no experience. That's kind of a cool thing. All right, awesome. Uh, a few people with a little, few people with a lot of experience. Excellent. Um, so I was curious to know a little bit about your audience when you're playing around with these. It'll help uh, help me tailor this uh, a little bit here. So I would definitely say that we're leaning more towards a little um, than a lot, but there's a few of you that do have a lot of experience in this. So that's good to know. Uh, I'm going to move this forward now to the next question um, as these ones are ticking along. And this one here is uh, how much experience you have with monkey tools. So if I can get you to, uh, to vote on this one for me, um, this would be uh, really helpful as well. And wow, that blue bar jumped up really, really, really fast. Okay, good stuff. This is uh, this is exactly what I was curious to know. And so let's go, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to close this one off here and get rid of it. Thank you for voting. I appreciate it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about monkey tools. So. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I am an accountant. Going to give you the brief intro here. I run a website called xlguru.ca, which has a website, a bunch of articles, and a forum. And I'm one of the founding partners of skillwave.training, along with Miguel Escobar, who now works for Microsoft on the Power Query team. And we brought Matt Allington in, um, uh, well, before Miguel left, obviously, uh, to be our third partner in this. I am a Microsoft MVP. I've been awarded every year since 2006. This is an award that I have to re-earn every single year and comes from community contributions that I make, like speaking at free meetups and, and different things. Proud to say that I was awarded 10 straight years in the Excel platform, or Excel program, rather. They changed me to data platform, which is the category that looks after Power BI, and in 2019, switched me back to um, Office Apps and Services, M365 Apps and Services, which is where I am now. That is the category that currently looks after Excel. I'm also a software developer and author. Uh, the developer aspect is around monkey tools, which we're going to see today. And of course, um, I've written a couple of books. We've got Emma's for Data Monkey and Master Your Data, which is the new edition of, uh, of this particular book here. And I would highly recommend that if you are going to, uh, to pick up a book on Power Query, check out Master Your Data. It is a complete rewrite over what we did with Emma's for Data Monkey. And uh, I think that you'll find that it has a ton of information in it to level up your game, no matter where you are on the Power Query curve. All right, let's start a little bit with my philosophy on how I actually approach different tasks. Uh, 
So my modeling philosophy is pretty much that I always start with raw data because you have to, right? Otherwise you're kind of making stuff up and that's not cool. And I use Power Query to go and connect to my raw data and bring it into Power Pivot to generate my fact and dimension tables. Now, what you will see here is that I always use or almost always use a three-stage approach to dealing with this. I will make a query that connects to the raw data source. Essentially, the job of this particular query is to normalize the data. So I just want to be able to see all the rows and columns of data that I can work with. The staging query is where I start reducing that down and try to get it into a place uh, that shows me the amount of data that I actually want to work with. And then my fact and dimension tables are where I carve it up to serve my dimensional model properly. In the data model itself, of course, this is where we relate our tables together and create our DAX formula. And then after that, we go and we feed our visuals, whether that's a pivot table or a pivot chart or you know something different. Okay. So my um, my sort of philosophy around working with this thing here is that this is the um, by far the the. I don't know, the best way for me to be able to actually uh, break my data so I know exactly where it is and get it all into the right sort of organization and, and proper format. Um, <clears throat> from there, what I'm going to do is I'm generally going to start in Excel. Uh, this is kind of the way that I approach almost everything. I am, I've am i been working with Excel for a long time. I love Excel. It's the tool that I use to do the majority of the jobs that I do, particularly with my finance background. I find that it actually works best for a lot of the things that I need. Um, if I need to share it with someone, though, this is where I'm going to do something like publish it to Power BI. Now, I could publish the Excel workbook, or of course, I could go and actually do it you know, differently. But one of the cool things we can do with an Excel model is publish it directly to Power BI. Even as an Excel workbook, we can build reports online, and then we can share those with our audience. So that's kind of cool. Don't ever need to open Power BI desktop if I don't want to. If, on the other hand, I decide to do that, I can always go and import my Excel model into Power BI Desktop, and then I can go and build some reports there for different things. So maybe I want to go and add, you know, role level security, or I want to use some of the really cool visuals that Power BI has, uh, or custom visuals. And at that point, then I would publish to PowerBI.com as well. So what you'll see here is that generally, no matter where I intend to send my model, whether it's direct to Power BI from Excel or via Power BI or to Power BI via Power BI Desktop, I'm generally starting in Excel. I find that this is the best tool for me to be able to very quickly build things up and actually look at my data and understand it. Um, I find Power BI is much better for summarizing and sharing, where Excel to me is better for deep data analysis. And I know that that can be a contentious point with some people as well, right? I mean, that's, uh, but you know, regardless, that's my philosophy. Um, <clears throat> now, Let's talk a little bit about monkey tools. How does that actually factor into the equation here? So the target audience for monkey tools is Excel users that are building models with Power Query and Power Pivot. So if you're working in Excel primarily, this tool is gonna to be something that's pitched to you. If you are primarily a Power BI user, the tool wasn't built for Power BI. It's built more for Excel. Having said that, it does also allow us to audit models that we receive from others, whether they come in Power Query or whether they come in Excel or whether they come in Power BI, because we can actually connect to Power BI models. Uh, this is an add-in that does have a potential price point. We do have a forever free version, and this will be forever free. I have one code base that we actually publish and we share. So every time there's an update to, um, to Monkey Tools, it gets released to all of the free users as well. The deal is, though, is that some of the features are restricted to pro users. Now, you can get a pro trial for two weeks. It will revert back to free. Almost everything in the, the uh, pro license works in the, in the pro trial. There is only one exception to that, one particular report where we actually cut half the data out because we believe that it's super valuable. Um, and, of course, there is a pro license subscription. You can find full details of that at monkeytools.ca. We have a specific website that is dedicated to it, which uh, has the very clear pricing models all out there. And you can find exactly what features you're looking, uh, you know, find out what features are being used where. There's support articles and all kinds of good stuff there. Now, <clears throat> how is Monkey Tools broken down? Um, the ribbon is, it actually adds a new Monkey Tools ribbon in Excel. Uh, and this ribbon is wide enough that it actually has to be cut into two pieces here. I basically break this down into two sets of features that we use. So we have what we call convenience features, 
And these are basically repurposed buttons from Excel in other places. So the get data button from table button, launch Power Query Editor, show queries and connections, all of these exist on the Power Query get data menu or on the data tab. So launch Power Query, for example, is actually on the get data menu. It's a little bit buried. So we actually bring it up and surface it right up front. Things like manage data model, pivots and filters, refresh all. Of course, those are on the standard the data tab that you'll, you'll be able to find. We also have a ton of features that are monkey tool specific features that we add. We put all of these on one tab because these things are all related. We build models starting in Power Query and then we work on them with Power Pivot. So I like to try and minimize tab flipping as I'm going along and working through the jobs that I'm doing. Now it's demo time. So we're gonna jump over into Excel. I'm gonna go and pop open an Excel workbook and uh, I'm gonna walk you through some of the different features that we actually have in monkey tools. So we're gonna start uh, right now. Let me just go and uh, open up a sample model that I want to work with. And it is, where is it? Here we go, query monkeys dash begin. Um, so basically what do I have? I have three tables in this workbook. There is absolutely nothing connected to the data model at all. So if we go and take a look at the data model, uh, what we should see right now is it is blank and empty, okay? Uh, we can also see that there are no queries in this workbook whatsoever either. This drives me crazy that my query pane has started to open really narrow. Don't know why, I'm trying to figure that one out. Um, but what I'm looking for is I'm looking to create a pivot table here and possibly a pivot chart if I want to do that. The big thing that's really important to understand about this is that I want a pivot table, which actually treats um, September 30th as my year end. So this is uh, potentially tricky for some people to do. So I wanna be able to build something up that shows my total count of transactions and my sales and my budget. All right, what do I have to start with? I've got three tables, I've got sales, categories, and budgets. These happen to all live inside this workbook because it's much easier to demo things when everything is in one place. What don't I have? I don't have a calendar table, okay? And again, none of this is in the data model. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start right quick here by going to the Query Monkeys menu, and you're gonna see that there's a whole bunch of different commands in this area that we're gonna look at, not all of them, but most of them today. Uh, I'm gonna go and grab the uh, Table Monkey, and what Table Monkey does is naturally, whenever I'm presenting, it opens on the other monitor. Um, what Table Monkey does is it actually identifies all of the tables and named ranges in your workbook. So you can see these guys here are my individual tables. What's interesting about these guys is you can see their actual table names. So we've got categories, that's this table over here. Okay, so if I go and take a look at the table design, sorry, my bad, this one's sales, this one's categories, this one, as it turns out, is table one. So Notice I've got table one here. If I click on this, it will select the table. It will select the table, it'll select the table. So I can sort of see um, where things are going. No, 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 Fernando, I don't have a calendar table, but I'm going to need a calendar table. That's the point. So don't, uh, don't, get me, uh, um, don't get me wrong on this one. The calendar table is absolutely essential in the grand scheme of things here. I just don't happen to have one in this file. So here's what I'm gonna do. First thing, I'm gonna rename table one but I don't wanna to have to close monkey tools to do that. So if I right click on this, I can come back and say, look, this is gonna be budgets. And what you'll see is that at this point in time, if we actually take a look at the table design tab, it's now been renamed here. So this is a convenience feature to make life a little bit easier when you identify really quickly, hey, I've got tables in here that have weird names, um, you can actually fix them. You can also, if you want to, you can right click on one of your queries at the end here and it will rename that without renaming the table. What you see in this case here is that we're actually gonna create three different queries for every table. This is the source table. The yellow ones are staging queries. So they're gonna be created as connection only. And um, then uh, finally, the green tables here will load to the data model. I can decrease the number of staging queries that I want or increase them. I can actually turn off the ability to load to the data model. So this will create a connection only query called budgets. I can even say, hey, I don't even want the budgets table at all. And it'll ignore that. And if I prefer, I can actually reduce the number of layers of all of the different queries themselves. This will save as a default for your form the next time you open it. The text that's being prefaced in front of the table names can also be controlled here. I'm gonna leave all this as default because I'm happy with the way it's set up. I'm just gonna hit create. And what's gonna happen now is this is gonna go through and it's gonna create all of these queries for me. So you can see that we've had six that were created as connection only and boom, there we go. The rest of them have been loaded to the data model. The nice thing about this is this took seven seconds to complete. It took a lot more to talk about than it did to actually get the work done.
And what you can see now is if I go to my monkey tools tab and hit manage data model, so my tables are in the data model, it's all good to go. And if I go to diagram view, I can see that they are here. So I'm just gonna grab these guys here. I'm gonna go and link, oops, let's not link category to amount, Ken, that's a terrible idea. Let's go and link category to category, much better, and category to category over here. I'm gonna hide these two columns as well, uh, but I'm not gonna hide the date ones, and then I'll show you why that is in a little bit here. Okay, so there we go. We're getting our data model into the proper state where a category is linked to category and category is linked to category. So we're getting set up to start with here. But now what we need to do is we need our calendar table if we're gonna go and start building things. And I don't have one of those in this model yet. So here's the thing, uh, Fernando, I don't wanna have to create a table in the Excel worksheet for that. That's a waste of time. So I'm gonna go and use our calendar monkey to go and actually create a dynamic calendar table that reads from the data. Now, this one took a little bit to open, and if you're really astute, you would have noticed that there was a query that actually was created down here and then disappeared. We actually use Power Query to read metadata from the other Power Queries in your workbook so that we can actually do some cool things. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change my year end. So I'm gonna go back to September, and I'm gonna pick up September 30th. And this can be any September 30th. It doesn't have to be the correct one that's inside this data. In fact, this data only runs, I believe, from 2018 to 2019, and I'm picking a 2022 year end. I can name the calendar what I want. I can change the type of calendar here as well. So if you need a 445, we can actually build that for you. Uh, I am going to turn it, tell it now though, where, how do I want my calendar to actually work? And what it, the calendar needs to do is it needs to know the first date for the fiscal year and the last date for the fiscal year and build a calendar for everything in between. So I'm gonna go and pick up to grab my staging sales table as the base for my calendar. And it says, okay, we found a calendar column called date. And you'll notice that it's come back and it says, there's only one column in this table that is actually formatted as a date or date time. So we're gonna use that one. For my latest date, I could pick the same table. I'm gonna pick a different one because I always budget in advance. But what I do want you to notice is that if I picked up something like categories, which doesn't have any dates, it would tell me, hey, there's no date columns in this table. You're not allowed to use that. So I'm gonna go back and say staging budgets, and it says the only column that would work here is date. What we're gonna do next is click next. And these are the default options that Power Query or that Query Monkey or sorry, Calendar Monkey comes back and actually says. It says, you're probably gonna want a fiscal year, a quarter fiscal year, a month of fiscal year, and your month name, but we're not gonna grab the calendar year and things like that, okay? So here's the deal though. If I want my regular calendar year, I can click the button. When I do this, we actually write this in as a default so that next time you open up the calendar monkey, it will have your default saved for you, right? We're all about saving time, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. Oh, and if you were using a 445 calendar, you would actually have a periodicity column over here for period IDs. I'm gonna click next and you'll notice that it says, would you like to add relationships to the tables? If I had selected the same tables, if I'd selected sales and budget and targeted my columns against sales and budget, then this would have automatically checked these. It's only gonna serve up tables that actually live in the data model, and I chose to actually build my logic against staging tables that are not. That's why these weren't automatically checked. At this point, I'm gonna hit create, and now it's gonna go through, it creates my start date query, creates my end date query, and it's now loaded 1,096 rows into the data model. It also gives you back the status of exactly what's going on. And at the end of it, it says, listen, we have some advice for you that we want you to do. Now, I'm gonna go and follow this advice right here. You can leave this open. You can even check the box, say close this automatically, but I know what I need to do. So I'm gonna hit close. I'm gonna go to monkey tools. Thank you, Fernando. I appreciate that you love this. Um, and what's gonna happen here is I'm just gonna go over to the, um, uh, what about different fiscal starts? Um, so the fiscal starts that we support in the calendar is the um, is the beginning of, so we always pick a fiscal year end. If you are using something like a March 31st year end, it will automatically go from April 1st to March 31st. Uh, I can't set up something yet. I haven't actually programmed the logic in to do like the 15th of the month to the 15th of the month. That's That's a little bit different. But July to June, yeah, no problem. Okay, and actually I'll, I'll show you that right away here uh, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort my month sort short. I'm gonna sort this by the month number. I wish I could do this for you, but unfortunately 
the Excel team doesn't give me a way to actually set up these sorts. I, I, I'm dying for this ability, but they haven't given me that. So let me go and change the uh, day here. We're going to sort this by day of week. Okay. I'm now going to go and just check my diagram view on this, and you'll notice that the calendar table got made with the relationships in place. The other thing that I unfortunately can't do for you is I can't do this. Right-click and hide from client tools. I wish I could because I believe that the foreign key on every single table relationship should be hidden by default. Why did I not hide this to begin with? Well, because I cannot programmatically create a relationship between a column that's hidden and a column that is visible. Unfortunately, um, the object model that we use to actually code this stuff doesn't see invisible columns. It can't find them. I have some cool code where we can actually make that happen, but I can't actually create relationships between the two. Okay, so um, yeah, there's there's a lot of power in here, Isaiah, for sure. I mean, I've worked uh, pretty hard on it, um, but uh, you know, <laughs> but um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it's all about trying to make life easy. I mean, the cool thing that I want you guys to realize about this as we go through is what I'm doing right now is I'm actually building a data model, and this is a completely no code experience, right? Because here's the next thing, right? I need measures, so here's what I'm going to do. I could go and create a basic measure. Let me go and build this up without writing any DAX. So I could go and say, give me the sales column, give me the amount column. And it says, oh, we're pretty sure you want to sum it. So we're going to create you some of amount and store it on the sales table. And here's the DAX for it right here. So this is to me better than a drag and drop into the bottom using an implicit measure because this creates an explicit measure. On the other hand, this creates a single explicit measure and that's way too much work for Ken because I'd have to do it three times. So instead, we built this thing called the Multiple Explicit Measures Monkey. And it drives me crazy. This always opens on the other monitor when I'm presenting. It doesn't do that when I'm using it in real life. Uh, but here's the deal. So what this does, this will allow us to create multiple measures at once. What the multi-measure monkey does is it identifies your fact tables in your model. So basically anything that's got stars all the way around it. And we're looking for linked fact. If you do use disconnected measure tables, you can actually check the box and it will bring them up. I don't have one in this in this model. Uh, also measure tables, which are um, a slightly more uh, nailed down form of that. If you want to see your dimensions, you can actually bring those in. I don't recommend aggregating your dimensions, but sometimes you need to, okay? So we're gonna go with fact tables. If you wanna create yourself a new measure table, you can do it here. I'm not gonna bother. I'm just gonna go to next. And what you'll see now is it comes back and it says, all right, so we've got a budget table you have a sum of amount column. Now this is blue because this is the first instance of a conflict in measure names. We have two tables that both have an amount column, that's okay, but we can't have two measures with the same name. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rename this one, I'm gonna call it budget dollars. And you'll notice the blue and the red went away. The red is the additional conflict. So they're the ones that are gonna fail if you try and create them, okay? The blue one would work. I'm gonna go and make this one here. I'm gonna call it sales dollars. You'll notice that for budgets, we're we are taking the amount column. It is a whole number data type. That's what's actually in the column. We are summing it, although you could change that. Giving it a name, you could change your number format here. We provide you with a few and we allow you to store it on different tables if you want to. If you do use a proper measure table, it will default to the measure table. Otherwise it defaults to the table that actually has the column. Uh, I would also, I'm doing the same thing for uh, for this guy here for sales. I'm also gonna add another aggregation here. Now, what I'm looking for in this case is I'm looking for a count of the transactions. And the easiest way to get that is to do a count of the rows of the table. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select not the amount, category, or date columns. I'm gonna connect, uh, select the sales table. And you'll notice it says this is a table here. We are going to do account rows, and I'm going to call this one here transactions. I'm going to try and spell transactions correctly because it drives me nuts when I don't. This is going to be a whole number format, and it's going to be on the sales table. Um, and Fernando, you're asking, are those measures written in MDX in the background? No, they're not. They're written in DAX because DAX is the formula language for Power Pivot. Um, pivot tables use MDX in order to actually bring things out, but this is all DAX formulas. So when I now go and hit create, it just went and created all three measures. Boom, done. Takes that long, right? Again, longer to talk about than it does to actually do it. So now, if I wanna go and create myself a nice little pivot table, for example, I'm gonna come up to the pivot to and filters menu on Monkey Tools. You'll notice that we have the ability to go and grab from the data model. So I'm gonna do that, put it in an existing worksheet. And here are all my tables. 
Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab for my calendar table. I'm going to grab my fiscal year and put that on rows. I'm going to do month short. This is October. And um, back to the question that uh, who was it that asked about this one? Davisha, um, back to your question about what if I'm using a July to June year end? I use an October to September year end. So these are sorting in the correct order for those months. So January, June, September, October, meh, whatever, same difference. It's just about where you pick the fiscal scar. I picked an uh, September 30th year end. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my transactions, my sales, and my budgets, and boom, there we go. Okay, 100%, no code, data model, bringing tables into to Power BI, building measures, landing them in pivot tables. There we go. This is what um, this is what Monkey Tools is all about. Uh, Pranam, you asked, are you considering adding support for fiscal year calendar with 544 or 445 months? Let me just go back into calendar for a second here. Let me bring the calendar monkey back up. Where'd you go, calendar monkey? Calendar monkey is doing its thing. There we are. Um, so here we go. Um, would you like a 445 that starts, well, let's say that the year end was uh, for this particular year was, uh, I don't know, the 1st of January, 2023. I'm going to call this calendar 445. I'm going to base the year end start on the staging. Actually, I'm going to just base this on sales because I want this to connect automatically here. And we'll make this one based on budgets. We'll go next. We'll pick up some more IDs here. We'll say next. We're going to add the relationships. I've already hidden these. So I'm going to have to do it manually, but I'm going to hit create. So here we go. We just built a 445 calendar for the model. And the nice thing about this is that I can now go back into manage data model. And because I have a 445 calendar as well as a regular calendar, I can now report on two different bases. So if I need to see it reported on a 445 calendar basis, I can. There you go. Okay. So yes, I am considering, no, I've added support for 544 and 445. One thing I don't do. Okay. So if you're in one of those weird calendar years, one thing I don't do is I don't support odd catch-up years. Okay, that one is uh, is a little bit weird. The calendars I have are pure 445 or 454 or 544. So if you have a catch-up year component to it, that's going to mess it up. Um, I'm it's on my list, but we're not there yet. Okay, so so there we go. That is the uh, that is the first um, example of what we're looking at with uh, with Monkey Tools. The the sort of main gist of this is to pull the queries and the uh, and the measure sort of sections together and build something um, cool and quickly. The idea here is you can actually go and use Monkey Tools to build this model here if you know exactly what you're doing with it and and you know run through it. it takes me about three minutes to build a data model. Uh, if I do this manually, it would take me at least ten or fifteen. Right, so that's a, a big, big difference uh, along the way here um, in productivity. Uh, all right, I'm going to close this one here down, and we're going to go and look at a, another um, uh, another little feature of Monkey Tools here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start with a blank workbook right now, and I'm going to insert a new query here, which is called the Smart Folder Monkey. Okay, so what's going to happen with this one? is I'm going to create a files list query here. And what this does is it actually goes and creates a files list based on the actual workbook path for this workbook. So in order for this to work, this needs to be saved. So I'm just going to go and hit save. And let me just grab the file path that I'm working with here. Do, do, do. And this one is going to be a smart folder live. So I'm just going to go and hit save on this one here. Yes. And the important part that I want you to realize about this, I just need to get rid of this for a second because I need to be able to see my SharePoint syncing uh, going on here, is if I go and close this workbook and then reopen it, okay, um, this file is now returning a file path that is on my SharePoint site. And if I go to look at this particular guy here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and uh, Actually, I'm just going to go into it and edit it because I want to make sure that my credentials have all passed through. Uh, it wants to know about data privacy. So I'm going to come in here and tell it, hey, listen, this current workbook is organizational. Why I should ever have to define current workbook is completely beyond me. But here's the deal. I am not going to check the ignore privacy box that everybody likes to check to make formula firewall issues go away. We're going to leave that in place. 
And once I do this, what you'll see is that this is going to come back and it says, of course, that my credentials are invalid. So I'm going to sign in as a different user. And sorry, on the other window, I'm going to hit my own username and hit this is just drives me crazy too. I'm going to sign in as a different user, pick my own name that it prompted me with, and then say connect because I'm plainly a different user. Um, and now we get the list of all of the files that are actually sitting in this folder. So I can now go and reference this, call this output, and let's just filter this thing down here to the uh, which folder do I actually want? I want my do, do, do monkey tools add in general. Let me get blank. Awesome. Okay. So this is the file folder that I'm looking for. So this is the root of the folder that I actually saved this into. I'm going to go close and load two. And I'm going to load this to a table on the existing worksheet. Okay. So here comes my output for what we actually have here. All right. Now, here's the interesting part. I'm going to hit save, file, close. Now, I'm just going to wait for this to sync because this is important. So it's happening on my other monitor. So just bear with me for a second while I let this uh, let this do its thing. Um, it says that it has been uploaded 12 seconds ago. That is fine, but I would like to see this processing change go away. And of course, it's going to take forever because I'm on a Teams call. Uh, but once that is done, uh, you know what? Let's see if we can pause it anyway. We're going to go and pause this syncing for two hours. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm now going to double click on it from my local folder and reopen this file. And what I want you to notice is that we now have a local file path. And this is an absolute nightmare if you're trying to use a parameter table in order to refresh data. So here's what's going to happen at this point in time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit data refresh all. And what I want you to notice on this one here is that it has worked. And I can tell you that because there is a file that starts with the tilde dollar sign, and that is a temp file. You never see a temp file if you're opening the file from SharePoint. You always see a temp file if you're opening it from the local folder. And what you can see here is that the refresh does spin and does work. So this smart switches between SharePoint and the local file using the smart folder monkey. Okay, so there's a function for get parameter. If you're familiar with my book, the get parameter function, we can inject that right away. We also have a smart folder function. If you decide to use the smart folder monkey, it actually injects both of those, gives you the files list. All you need to do is tell it that your privacy is okay. And at that point in time, this will now allow you to refresh the file, whether you open it up and it gets a local or a remote file path. Okay, so this is pretty cool. Uh, obviously this is an Excel workbook thing. This is not a Power BI thing because Power BI doesn't have a formula to return the local file path. Okay, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, key thing to be to know about this stuff as well though, um, you'll notice that the parameter table and function, this particular piece here will inject the table and the fn get parameter function. The smart folder function feature here will also inject the fn smart folder function. These are available on a free license, everything in this area here. This one requires a pro license or a pro trial. The big difference between this one, we hook it all up for you. If you don't want to pay the pro trial, that's cool. You can inject the pieces, but you've got to manually put these things together. Okay? So, um, but it's covered in our documentation. We'll tell you how, but uh, you know, it's just more convenient if you use the uh, the smart folder monkey. So, uh, so this is kind of nice, as I say, because you now have something you can actually uh, open, and every time you open it up, it just works. And that is something that I highly value when things just work. Um, all right, let me close this one off. Uh, I don't see any questions on that one at all. So I'm going to assume that uh, that was either a really good demo or you don't care about that one, one or the other or both. Um, but uh, here's what's going to happen. Let me turn this guy back on here and I'm going to get back into some more um, modeling stuff here uh, instead. So um, <laughs> yes, indeed, I am the documentation. Now, nah, listen, um, actually, I'm and. For that reason, I mean, this is one of the things, um, that's a great segue. Thanks, Fernando. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we actually created the Monkey Tools website. 
Um, one of the reasons is because one of my friends told me that my old website for it was horrible. So we actually built a really nice one that has everything here. Uh, it also has a knowledge base with a bunch of articles that actually show documentation on things like an overview of what Monkey Tools actually does with lots of pictures and different things around there. So um, I don't have every article in here. There's a lot that I still need to work on, but I'm trying to uh, to complete that so that I am not the documentation, but rather you can find the documentation here. Um, all right, let me show you, uh, let me show you, hmm, yeah, timing wise, I want to show you the stuff that's more uh, appropriate for data modeling and whatnot. Um, so, and of course my notes just froze on me too. That's always awesome. Uh, all right, let me go and jump into a pivot sleuth demo. So I'm going to go and open one up, which if I can find it is called measures on facts. So here we go. All right. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people asking, why do I actually have this? Uh, Randall, will parameter fields and hierarchies in Power BI desktop be coming to Excel? I am sure that they will one day. How long a way that day is, I do not know. Um, but the thing is, is that there's a lot of things that are in uh, in Power BI today um, that have obviously diverged and are, are moving way ahead of Excel, uh, particularly on the data modeling side. Um, the reason for that is because the uh, analysis services engine that is uh, built into the Excel program is um, version 11.03. It is quite old, but it was so deeply nested into the Excel architecture that it made it very, very difficult for the Excel team to make changes. Uh, in my opinion, this is one of the big reasons that Power BI exists as a product today is because the team wanted an ability to be able to move forward. And if you look carefully at Power BI's structure, they have a very, very different ecosystem constraint compared to what Excel does in that every version of Excel that goes out always has to be back compat tested to make sure they're not going to break anything. Power BI, nope, you open a file in this month's version, it will not work in an old version anymore. They don't care. It doesn't matter. So it's, it you know, really sort of breaks that line to say, hey, we can always push forward. Um, so there's two sort of divergent paths there that are our challenge. So the Excel team uh, needs to figure out a way to be able to rev the Power Pivot engine inside Excel without breaking stuff in the, from the past. And this is a, a real challenge that I know they're working on it. I don't know when it's going to eventually be done. But, you know, my feeling is that at some point in time, this is going to get resolved. How long it is, I don't know. All those new features, calculated tables, uh, you know, parameter fields, all those kind of things. Once they resolve that problem, then those will eventually end up showing up in Excel. But, you know, like I say, whether or not it happens, I believe it will. How long? Don't know. Don't have any info on that. Uh, okay, let's let's talk a little bit more about this one here. So what am I pulling up here? This is a tool that we call Pivot Sleuth. And what Pivot Sleuth is all about is figuring out why relationships between tables may be needed. This is a very irritating error message. And unfortunately, you can click go away, but next time you open the file, it's going to come back. So we built something here to help people understand what is going on. So if you click on Pivot Sleuth, it will actually bring up, oops, let's try and get this in front. What is going on here? Do, 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 do. I don't know why this is deciding to show up behind my Excel. There we go, that's better. So what Pivot Sleuth does is it comes back and it says, listen, We've identified that there's an issue here. The sales category field doesn't have a relationship or doesn't have a relationship path that can be used in order to go and filter these tables. There's something going wrong in this particular case, so you need to look into this. And it actually goes and provides you with a little bit of help here in order to try and figure out what exactly is going on. The issue in this case is the category that is being used on the pivot table field down here actually comes from the sales table. Okay, this is a problem because if we go back and we actually look at our dimensional model for this file, we're using this field. Oh, sorry, this one right here on our pivot table. This cannot work its way through the relationship path to come down and filter this field. This is one of the very, very big reasons why for everything that is um, on these tables, what I recommend you do, if it's on the many side of relationship, you hide it. And if you do that, when you drop back to Excel, it's going to rip that field off because you can't have it. This forces you to use categories from the correct table. And when you do this, and we go back to Pivot Sleuth, and we bring it over here, you'll notice that there's no issues. Everything is happy. 
Okay, so this is the first thing it does. It actually tells you, listen, you've used a foreign key on a table instead of a primary key for filtering. Um, so we don't want that to happen. And it actually does provide you with some advice down the bottom on exactly how to fix that. So this is the first uh, Pivot Sleuth demo that I want to show you. And I want to show you a little bit more complicated one here um, as well. So uh, let me go and show you uh, this one here, measure table. Um, I know a lot of people that love measure tables. I am of mixed emotions on these things. I think the um, the challenge around, uh, hang on a second, let me close Excel completely here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right, now let's try that again. Um, so I'm of mixed emotions on pivots on, on measure tables. Uh, the reason why measure tables were, oh, I saved this, that wasn't so good. Hold on a second, let me just go into monkey tools and replicate my error again, because it looks like I've got an auto save happened on something. Do, 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 unhide columns, there we go, boom, there we are, there's our relationships, maybe needed error. Save, because that's the way it's supposed to be. So, what happens here? I know a lot of people that love measure tables. I think this is actually a hangover from when Power Pivot was super unstable and you actually had to delete tables and bring them back. People put their measures on measure tables so that you didn't have to recreate the measure tables. So, the deal is, though, is that what you'll see is that people use these disconnected measure tables like this. And if we take a look at the data model, you can see that over here I've got this disconnected table with all these measures on it. And then they wonder, why am I getting this relationship between tables maybe needed? The reality is, this is a perfectly valid thing to do. There's nothing wrong with it at all. The problem, well, let's ask Pivot Sleuth. So if we go in to take a look at Pivot Sleuth and we bring this over here, Pivot Sleuth says, listen, we've got all kinds of problems going on here. What is going on? And if we take a look at budget year, it says, look, there's no relationship path here. Uh, by the way, this error message or this uh, tooltip message um, may eventually end up disappearing on you. So you can actually click on it to actually bring up the thing here. And it gives you a whole bunch of information here. Okay. The interesting part about this one is if we actually click on it, it says measures a disconnected table. Your measures will most likely calculate correctly, but these tables always, always cause this particular issue. If this table is intended to be a measure table, flag it as such by hiding all of the unaggregated columns on the table. And basically, uh, what happens? All right, um, it, what happens with this one here is if I now go back and follow the advice from uh, from Monkey Tools and hide the unaggregated column, at this point, this goes away. So, um, Davisha, you say you like measure tables because you have over 30 measures on one of your data models. Uh, keeping it all together works for you. That's fantastic. Personally. I actually prefer to store my budget measures on my budget table, my sales measures on my sales table, because if I hide all the unaggregated columns on those tables, then these basically act like folders for me. And I still have a search that I can use to find things. But again, you know, the reality is on this one here. Um, so Fernando, you've got a comment that you organize them into folders, not in Excel, you don't. Because in Excel, you can't, because that feature does not exist. It does in Power BI. So for me, these tables act like folders because when I go and actually pull up a data model, if I actually segregate all of my measures back onto their original tables, hide all the unaggregated columns, then these guys all pop up to the top like this. So that kind of helps me classify, classify them in this way. So I totally get where you guys are at. I, I totally understand and I understand the goal for it. Um, I don't feel that it's the right necessary method in Excel to me putting these on measure tables. Um, yeah, and fair enough, Devisha, I, I totally get that you're, uh, you're Power BI first. Um, if I wanted to classify these things, I can always create multiple disconnected measure tables, hide all the unaggregated columns, and again, these will sort of act like folders at that point. So, so for, you know, for what it's worth. Let me throw you one more on the Pivot Sleuth. I think Pivot Sleuth is actually one of the really cool features that we actually do. This is a complex model. We won't go through and uh, and debug everything on this one here, but you're going to get an idea as to just how messed up these things can actually be. Once again, we've got the message. We go and we hit Monkey Tools and ask for Pivot Sleuth. And what you can see when we bring it up is we actually give you all kinds of different context help. Every one of these colors means something different. So in this particular case here, you're using a foreign key. It might be working, but we recommend you switch it to a primary key. Uh, that's the same issue that we have down here, but this one has some additional components around it. Uh, this one has no filter connection that's going to these particular tables. This one here tells you um, that it can't be filtered by business line because there's no relationship between these. So based on this information, if you go through and you actually get a clean bill of health on this, um, things will work. Actually, this one's kind of interesting because here's what I'm going to do. Business line actually isn't adding any value here. So I'm just going to take this off. 
And this is an interesting thing around Pivot Sleuth to me. Once I've got that gone, the relationship may be needed error disappears. But I still don't believe that everything is healthy with this pivot table. If you come back and you look at Pivot Sleuth again, Pivot Sleuth says, listen, these are foreign keys. It might work for now, but we recommend that you switch it. Because if you add another fact table to this model that doesn't have a good relationship here, then it will break. Okay, So if in doubt with these things, it's not a bad idea to do a quick sanity check with Pivot Sleuth to say, is my pivot table looking healthy and whatnot? So um, that can be a, a useful, uh, useful thing there. Uh, one challenge that we don't deal with, um, we are reading what actually makes Excel tick behind the scenes to pop these messages. So if you're using virtual relationships like use relationship cross filter, um, treat as and things like that, uh, we don't actually... Um, like the val or the measure may be very valid, but we're trying to figure out how to suppress that message. Those ones we recommend, listen, put it on a table and you know hide all of the unaggregated fields and that's what's gonna make that go away. Uh, okay, let me see here. So let's take a look at another uh, little feature here. You know what, I'm in, uh, I'm in a file. We have some DAX measures and things like that. Um, actually, uh, let me just go in and fix something on my data model really quickly here. I'm going to go back and hide my unaggregated columns for these. So Chit Details has a bunch of these guys here. Actually, this is good. I can actually show you my way of dealing this. So you'll notice here that Chit Details is a fact table. Budgets is a fact table by virtue of the fact that we only have stars next to them. I've hidden all the unaggregated columns here. So when I now go back to Excel, what happens is by hiding all of the unaggregated columns, these now get flagged as proper measure tables. These are my folder names. Okay, so I've got my chip details. All the measures related to chip details are here. If I can't find one, I can still search if I want. So that's the way that we sort of do it in uh, in Excel. Um, can we have an alert that the monkey sleuth has some information to give us before actually clicking on the button? Uh, great question. Um, I have not done anything like that. The main reason is that I would need to be constantly scanning your pivot tables and then changing the icons on the top here. I think the overhead of that would actually be pretty um, pretty high. Uh, it's not like it's something that I can analyze as soon as I analyze your model because every pivot table connects to the model individually. So I would actually have to scan for every single pivot table in the workbook um, along the way. But uh, it's something I'll consider for sure. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how I would do that with a minimal impact. Um, or maybe it's saving, give a warning. Yeah, again, I mean, the challenge is that I got to run an analysis across every one. If you've got 40 pivot tables in your workbook and I try and do something like that right as you hit the save button, you're going to shoot me or, or you're going to uninstall my software. So I, I have to be really careful with that, um, Fernando, uh, but it is something definitely that I will uh, I will look at and consider. Um, all right, let me show you DAX Sleuth. Uh, so DAX Sleuth here is uh, basically a um, dependency tree tracer for your DAX measures. Uh, I know there are other softwares that do this kind of stuff. I built mine a long time ago. But um, basically the concept behind this is we actually flag your measures by type. So implicit measures are shown in orange. Uh, I don't think I have any implicit measures, and yet Monkey Tools is telling me I do. This happens when somebody drags a field onto the pivot table, then removes it. It removes the implicit measure from here, but it still exists. It's just hidden in your model. Remember, I can't find hidden things, except that I can. Explicit measures are listed in yellow. Calculated columns ugh, are listed in blue. If you click on it, it will show you what the formula is. It will also tell you exactly where it is used. So this one here, if I click on it, is used inside a timeline. So can I automatically delete your measures? No, 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 I cannot. But um, I can go into Power Pivot and I can go into Power Pivot. Here we go. I can go to Advanced. I can show implicit measures. And then basically, I just need to know what table it's on. So it's on chip details here. So there we go. Here is the implicit measure. So from here, I can actually delete it. Yes. Now that probably puts something behind my pivot sleuth. Yes, delete from model. So that will make it go away. If I now go back, let me just reconnect to my model, Active Workbook, and mm -hmm. reload it. And now go back to DAX Sleuth. What we'll see is that that implicit measure is now gone. Okay, so which is just the way it should be. Um, so cool stuff here. Uh, if we go and click on a measure, let's say we click on sales, we actually show you what pivot tables it's used on. So if you click on this, it will take you directly to those individual pivot tables or pivot charts or OLAP formulas. 
Okay, we actually scan all of these things looking for these. So this is your dependency tree to figure out where a measure is actually used. All the ones that are green, these have precedence. So if I look at month to date units, it calls sales units. Here's the sales unit signature. Uh, let me see if I can find one that's a little bit more complex here. Um, Cause I thought, ah, burger sold all time, fantastic. Let me just double click on that. You'll notice burger sold all time calls burger sold. Burger sold calls sales units. Here's the signature for sales units. So we can actually walk, walk the dependency tree of the DAX measure. And if you want to, you can even flatten the DAX measure down to figure out exactly what it's doing by saying, hey, listen, get me the nested calls, bring them in, wrap them in a calculate, because that's important for the, the uh, calculation to work properly. And this will show me exactly what is actually happening inside that measure. Now, I'm not saving anything here, but what if I wanted a new measure here for canned beer? And I've got this cool one for draft sold. It's formatted the way I want, the number formats are the way I want. I can actually grab this and say duplicate. I'm gonna call this new measure canned beer. Say okay. This is gonna create a new measure in the model and it will then add it into my tree view here. Uh, once it's here though, it has duplicated everything exactly. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm now gonna come back and I'm gonna change this to canned beer and say update. And I now have a new canned beer measure inside my workbook. So if I decide to close this, come back over to one of my pivot tables here. Uh, I'm not sure actual will be the best measure to use on this. Actually, let's just pull this off. Uh, but you'll notice that uh, down here we have a canned beer measure and there we go. It is working nicely and it is formatted the same as what the draft beer measure was as well. So just some, some handy tools for working with DAX. Um, I have designs on um, getting some of this stuff to be a little bit more robust and, and comprehensive. Let me get rid of this uh, legend here for a second, um, drop that down. If I look at things like canned beer, you'll notice that we indent by default. I use my own tools for, for dealing with this. You can unindent it to bring it back to what it looks like beforehand or indent it as you like. Um, you can change the font size on this thing actually with a control scroll, just like you can in, uh, in, um, in uh, the Power Pivot window as well. Uh, this is individual work. The user owns the MS Excel file, has this information, nobody else. Uh, Monkey Tools does not install any hooks inside your workbook at all. Everything that is done here is done in Power Query and is done in DAX. So when you save the workbook, the only person that needs Monkey Tools is the developer. My goal is never to try and get an additional hook that forces a license across your entire organization. I think that's horrible and I don't want to do it. Okay, so I license the software to the individual user. What my hope is, is that somebody will show somebody else in the organization how cool the tool is, and then they'll want to buy licenses for individuals. But the last thing I want to be doing is actually going and selling it to a software tool to somebody that doesn't need it. Okay, hopefully that answers the question, Fernando, I, I hope. Um, all right, uh, let's take a look at another um, little tool as well here, because we have our DAX sleuth. Um, we also have a query sleuth. And Query Sleuth works very, very similar to the DAX Sleuth. But what Query Sleuth does is it gives you a full dependency tree for all of your queries, indents your M code. We even, in this case here, highlight what the precedents are. So access DB in yellow here. You can click on that to see the source code for this one. This one uses files local and files SharePoint. And it actually, this is the structure, by the way, behind the, um, the smart switch, a try otherwise statement. And uh, you can drill it all the way back into the get parameter functions. You can make modification to your M code and hit update. Unfortunately, I do not have IntelliSense in here. So I hope you know your M if you're going to mess around with this stuff. But it's a very, very useful thing for being able to figure out, in this case, all connection only queries are yellow. Um, the uh, green ones are ones that are loaded to the data model. If it's loaded to the data model and worksheet, it comes out in orange. And if it's loaded to a worksheet table, it comes out in blue. So some handy things here. Uh, if you decide that you want to make uh, changes to something, I don't know, maybe we want to call this POS category codes. You can actually pin this because you now know that you need to make a change to another query. So over here, you have to have postal codes. We can close that. And then when we're ready, we can hit update and we actually get prompted to update all of them. And this will actually run the uh, the new queries or update its query signatures right into the, um, the Power Query modules as well. Uh, so what I like about this particular feature, I built this for two reasons. Number one, to trace a dependency tree. I hate the dependency tree tracer inside Power Query because it gives you everything and it looks like a bowl of spaghetti when you get into complex models like this. When you're working with this one here, we get a very clear line that actually shows up. Actually, let me, um, 
No, I don't want to exit right now. Uh, let me show you. We can also flip this from uh, from dependence to precedence. Uh, yes, that's fine. Um, so this is actually showing from the other way. So if I go and take a look at, say, start date, I can actually show you that it is only being used by calendar. But if I go and take a look at something like files local, it gets used by a lot of queries. Okay, so um, spaghetti for dinner. Hey, well, that's cool. Spaghetti is good for dinner. It's not good in your models. Uh, here's an interesting thing. We can check endpoints only. This shows me queries that only load to specific endpoints. Okay, now I'm looking at dependence right now, but if I go to precedence, this now shows me all of the queries that load to the data model. I need to click on these to see what the chain is here, but it's suppressed all of the additional connection only queries because these would show up under connection only. Here's the interesting thing. If you have a query, when you click endpoints only and show precedence, and you have a query that shows up in yellow down here, that query is no longer being or is not being used by the data model at all. It's not loading anywhere, not to a worksheet, not to the data model, not by another query or anything like that, because this is actually restricting it to only show my endpoint data. Uh, by the way, all selections that you make in here are written back into the registry um, for you. So when you open this next time, this observes your preferred, um, you know, sort of setup that you actually like to see. So if I hide legend on this, close it and reopen it, the legend is still hidden because I figure you get used to it. You don't need the space. Okay, so uh, so that's a cool uh, cool little uh, work with um, with these guys here uh, as far as um, the query sleuth goes. I do want to show you just sort of um, I'll show you the file that actually inspired the build of this, uh, and this one is a a very very complicated um, model. So let me just go and pop this open. Uh, is there any or is there any amount of data transferred to Monkey Tools? Uh, so, Fernando, are you asking, am I actually sending any data out to the Monkey Tools website? Is that the, the question? I just want to make clear I'm, I'm going to answer the right question. Yeah. All right, cool. That is the question. Um, the answer is no, I don't send anything out. Um, all of the all of the data that we work with here is all processed in your local um, CPU and RAM. Um, we don't actually send anything out. The only thing that Monkey, Monkey Tools sends out uh, at all is is a couple of things. When you open up your workbook, we check your license. That we send out to our license server. Okay, so and I think that probably makes some sense. The only other time that we ever send any data out is if you go and you hit log a bug, or log a query indenter issue, or log a feature suggestion. Um, at those points, then those guys there will actually send you to a website where, you know, for log a bug, we actually send you to a Microsoft forum where you can actually log your bug information in there. Uh, if you want to request a feature, you could do the same thing. Okay, so so let me show you this workbook. This is a this is a pretty crazy workbook. All right, so um, I'm going to show you a couple of things around this one. Uh, this has got a big table of contents in here, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run across to the area plan map. Uh, this is actually a, um, a model that uh, is used um, for a housing development uh, that is uh, well, is under construction actually, as we were, uh, as we know right now. Um, I was actually just down here the other day looking at just how far this thing has come. So I did some financial planning work on this particular piece. Um, this model was built using Power Query and Power Pivot in order to make things happen. Okay, so it's a very complicated thing with 25 sectors of product being built out over 25 years, really, really big. Uh, we had all kinds of interesting pieces that were in this. This is the map of how things fit together. Everything green is a worksheet. Blue is Power Query did all kinds of stuff here. Power Pivot, of course, the model, and then purple worksheets as well for summarizing things. This is the map of the Power Queries that went behind the scenes in order to reshape the data. Purple is a named range, or is a worksheet rather. These white things here are named ranges. The blue ones are queries that we're actually pulling in. All of these little white or little circles are off-page connectors, but not ordinarily off-page, that connect one query to another. The green ones are the data model tables. I drew this by hand because this thing was that complicated. If you go and you actually go and take a look at this, this is the amount of queries with multiple levels of steps all the way along the way. This is what Query Sleuth was actually, yeah, it is the matrix, absolutely. This is what Query Sleuth was built to, to understand because the client that I was working with was one of those people that like to change scope on things. And the problem that I needed to know was, if somebody changes level one staging parameters, what is that going to do to my model? So I would flip it to dependence. I'd look for level one staging parameters, double click on it and go, holy crap, I've got a lot of work that I need to do in order to be able to trace this through. 
Okay, so that's what this was sort of developed for in order to see what was going on. It's a very, very complicated uh, thing. Um, actually, forecast was the was the most insane. Look at that. That's just crazy. So the other thing about this, though, is that this uses Power Query and Power Pivot for all kinds of things. So the big question is, well, what's in this? And this is where we have this model summary report that we can actually run against this particular model to come back and provide us with some documentation. This is the one feature inside this tool that does not work with 100% fidelity in a pro trial. We actually suppress every other line, okay? Because we believe that documentation like this is something that you can help us pay for uh, for developing. Uh, yes, I did use Visio to draw those maps right now, absolutely. Manually, painfully, and redrew them every time we had a scope change. Uh, it was awful. And this is, again, this is why I sat down and programmed this tool. So this is my documentation report for my model sleuth that I can run. It tells me how many tables we have, how many relationships we have. Uh, we count how many are loaded to connections, worksheets. Uh, you will notice here that we also have a, um, a nice little thing in here that shows me that I have a table that is linked directly to Power Pivot that does not come through Power Query. This is something that I want to know about, or if I'm connecting Power Pivot directly to an external data source. In other words, am I using legacy connectors that don't feed through Power Query? We have all of our relationship information here, what's active, what's not, what's the cardinality. Of course, in Excel, this is always many to one. Uh, we talk about all the different tables. Notice this one here is pulling in from a worksheet table and is disconnected. This is a garbage piece that's gone in here. We tell you if your tables are snowflaked, these are all of the tables, the stats with unique values. Are they hidden? Are they not? Are there calculated columns? What do they actually look like? And down here, this is a listing of all of our DAX measures, okay, and all of our queries. What can we do with these things? Well, we can run a model memory usage report that tells you how much memory is being used, how much is not being used and can be recovered. We can run a nice little report that says, tell me about the unused items in your file, which will tell you that all of these DAX columns are not actually used and can be safely deleted. And these queries can also be removed because they are not actually being used. So there's some model information there as well. Now, um, what is the difference between this and DAX Studio? Uh, DAX Studio does different things than me. DAX Studio does, uh, does testing of the performance of, of actual um, refresh times of formulas. I don't do that kind of testing. Uh, I do a lot of reporting and testing. As a matter of fact, um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about uh, this report is that the information that we have in these, even though they don't have any drop downs, you'll notice these are actually tables. Okay, so I can turn on a filter button here. That was a feature request from one of my friends because they wanted to connect to this and reformat it using Dex Studio. So no problem. We work, you know, our Dex Studio can work in conjunction with our stuff, but we just do different things. I mean, they're they're very much for high performance testing of, of different stuff. So uh, I do have a couple of questions before the matrix, do I? I do, I see that. Um, Okay, does it mean license checking prevents offline work? Uh, we have something in there that will allow you to, so you do need to be online to install because we do install from an online installer. I don't have an offline installer. Um, when you are not connected, uh, you should not have an issue there. I mean, I built monkey tools so that it will still run when you are on a plane. It will allow you to do a license check and if it doesn't work, it, it will try again after a little bit. Um, if your license expires while you're offline though, that's gonna be a challenge. You need to get back online to, uh, to, um, to get it reactivated. Um, so yeah, so honestly, uh, Pranam, I use monkey tools on a plane all the time when I'm traveling and it's not an issue. So uh, sorry about that, I missed those. I think that hopefully grabs those. Um, all right, let me, uh, let me show you one more demo here before we go. Um, this one here is where I'm gonna open up a blank workbook. And what I'm gonna do is I'm connect, going to connect Power or to connect Monkey Tools to a Power BI desktop file. And if I'm lucky, uh, yes, excellent. I do have this in here. So we're gonna go to PBI models and I'm gonna grab this one called LP Azure SQL. So this is a Power BI desktop model that connects to an Azure SQL server and um, brings in some data using a bunch of different queries and creates DAX measures and all the good stuff, right? So what's gonna happen now is it's gonna load the Azure model, okay? And while that's cooking here, I'll get a pop-up that tells me that Monkey Tools has been, or that the model has been loaded. How do I know? Well, I can go and run a model summary report and boom, this is the model summary from Power BI, okay? So 
That's the first part. We can't give you everything that we do in Monkey Tools. Unfortunately, I can't tell you how much can be removed here, but I can tell you how much memory is in this. Uh, typically, when I'm in an Ask Me Anything session and somebody comes up to me and wants to talk about their Power BI model, the first thing I'll do is I'll actually hit it with Monkey Tools and run this kind of a report on it to get an idea of how big their data model is. Um, the next thing I do is I take a look at the stats here and try and figure out in this area here just how many calendar tables they have running behind the scenes because they never turned off the automatic calendar table generation. I've actually managed to uh, reduce one person's memory footprint by 95% by just flicking that one feature. I hate that feature. At any rate, so this is connecting to the Excel workbook, but here's the cool thing I want to show you. I want to import this model to Excel. I am connected to LP Azure SQL. I'm going to load this into a new workbook. And it says, look, we've identified that you've got a metrics table here, which was not generated by Power Query inside Power BI. So we can't import that. But what we're going to do is we're going to try and replace it for you with a Power Query generated stub. And in this case here, any missing tables will be generated with Power Query. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit import right now. And this is going to go through and cook. While it's doing that, I'm going to hop over here. Let me just get this out of the way for a second. And I'm going to show you that behind the scenes here, there is a data model. It has a single metrics table with all kinds of measures in it and a symbol MP column. This was not created in Power Query. It was created with just a regular new table kind of command. All right. Um, so we've got a bunch of reports, of course, and everything else. I can't bring those into Excel because, well, Excel doesn't support those kind of things. But it does support tables, relationships, Power Query, and DAX measures. Okay. So. Um, who are you going to remove from the meeting, Fernando? Are you going to remove me? I'm not sure that would be the wisest thing to do. Uh, so here's the uh, here's the thing. So uh, if I look under transform data, <laughs> if I look under transform data, um, what you'll notice is that these are all the queries that are here. Okay, so there's lots of stuff that's inside this particular Power BI desktop model. The thing is, is that I want a copy of it in Excel, and now I have one. Look at that. There's the Excel workbook. There's all the queries. The data has been loaded. Now it has come back and it said, look, that metrics table is a problem. It was a DAX table. I couldn't create it for you. So what I did instead is I actually created a metrics table in Power Query that has an empty column in it or one item of data in the column here. And if we actually go over and we take a look at the data model inside Excel now, what you'll notice is that now the the, uh, the picture is not pretty. The way it's laid out isn't awesome. I can't control that. Um, but the nice thing about this is that we've now created a data model. We've got all of the measures are all there. The only thing I need to do to make this into a good measure table is hide that from client tools. I need to hide my foreign keys on some other tables as well. And I need to set up my sorting hierarchies. And it actually tells me um, that I need to hide the data model columns. These are all of the columns that need to be hit. So I actually have a list that I need to go after. And I need to recreate a sorting hierarchy in this place here. But with all of this stuff done, I can now go and very easily say, hey, listen, actually, let's do a monkey tools. We're going to go and insert a new uh, table against the data model. And let me go and put my, I don't know, let's go and put the sales on here from the, um, we're going to go categories and we'll pick up the point of sale group. I've just now imported that model from Power BI into Excel. There is no other tool today that does this. Okay, Monkey Tools is the only one. Now, I do want to show you something else really quick. This is the last feature I'm going to demo for you. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and uh, and save this to a workbook. This is called just your data model. It's important this gets saved before um, to go through. Uh, how long does it take to have a decent grasp of monkey tools? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I mean, it takes it takes time to learn and, and play around with it and uh, and see different things. I'm sure you'll break some things and log me a bug at some point in time as well. Um, but the, uh, the reality is, is that, I mean, you'll learn certain features. There's a lot of features in here. I mean, that's the, the big thing. Um, so as Melinda says, I mean, how much time do you have? I mean, you know, we are adding to it uh, over time. I haven't been able to put much into it lately, but, um, you know, you'll find your favorite features that you use, you know, somewhat regularly. Uh, here's the last one I want to show you for, for today. A um, couple things we've got here. You can export your model components uh, as well. So if you want to export your queries or your full data model structure to a text file backup, you can do that. And then you can re-import from a text file backup into something else. Um, the more important one that I want to show you, though, is this. Export model tables to CSV. Uh, this is a feature that I got asked for um, from someone who said, look, I've got my data model, but I need to export it out to CSV files. Um, 
Now there's code to do this on the internet. It doesn't work anymore, which is interesting. I had to modify it to get it to go. But what we do here is we actually allow you in a pro version, in a free version, you can just export the flat out table. So you want to export budgets and calendar and categories out into individual CSVs? No problem. We will let you do that in the free version. But if you want to customize this, you can actually come back now and say, you know what? In my budgets table, I've got amount. I've got all these different things here. Cool. That's all good. I'm going to show this now in model view. And in model view, what we show you is we show you the fact tables. So I can now come back and say from these ones here, I am interested in exporting the item code. I'm interested in exporting the units. I'm interested in exporting the, I don't know, I'm not interested in the chit number. Actually, I'm not interested in any of these things. So I'm just going to collapse those down. So I'm going to get rid of this one. I'm going to get rid of this one. I want to export a table that has my dollar amount and my units, and I want the point of sale item code. And that's all I want out of this thing. I don't like the name of the point of sale item code. So I'm going to rename this one here and call it item. So we can actually rename that right there. So this is going out as item. My unit count is fine, but you know what? I'm going to rename this one as count. There we go. So we can do a little renaming there. I'm going to go and export this into my uh, desktop if I can actually find where the heck it lives. Uh, there we are. Okay, cool. So we'll go and export to desktop. Um, I can prefix it. So if I want to have it prefixed with a date, so I know what date that it's actually being exported. And I can even choose to export it into a variety of different export formats. I'm going to use comma. That's good enough for me. And what I'm going to do at this point in time, actually, you know what? I'm going to take the metrics table too, just so we can see that we're actually exporting two tables. And I'm going to go export. And this is actually now going to go and export all of that data out into a couple of individual CSV files. Now, this is going to take a little while because there's 348,000 rows of data in here, as you can see right up the top in this. But you'll notice that it is exporting and it is going out to a text file. Uh, people tell me that they use this to be able to use Power Pivot to go and actually create um, uploads into other database systems. Uh, if you are, or if you're using, say, Power Query to clean things up, you can load something into the data model and then export it to the CSV so that it's a much easier process, particularly if you need to get into things like pipe delimited files. We support that. Um, this is nice because it allows you to pick different columns from different places. The other thing that it can be really, really useful for is if you are doing a, a, um, a load of files from folder and you've got three years and it's starting to get really, really slow because every one of those files in the folder needs to be transformed, what you can do is you can say, let me run that refresh and wait for the darn thing to happen. It's going to take forever. Export all of the contents into CSV files. And now you can go back and say, okay, let's remove all of those files from the folder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine all files in folder, and then I'm going to append this already transformed data. Why? Because the already transformed data just needs to be streamed in super fast. It doesn't need to be transformed again. So it actually can be nice for, uh, for crystallizing some of those, almost for an incremental, but just kind of an offline incremental, if you like. Um, outside of that, the only other thing that I want to show you is that um, – we do have the ability uh, right here to log a bug or to make feature suggestions as well. The documentation will take you to the link on Monkey Tools uh, website so you can actually find out more about it. I have not shown you all of the features here. There are more. Um, so as, as Melinda says, I mean, how much time do you have there, uh, um, you know, um, for Fernando? Because, uh, you know, we do have a lot of different features in here, but I think you'll find the ones that you actually like uh, along the way. I have designs on adding more. Um, I don't really have a lot of time to talk about because uh, I'm running over. I mean, unless you guys want to stick around, I can give you a sneak peek as to, to the things that I'm working on. Uh, but I don't want to be keeping you uh, much longer than, uh, than what I promised here. And I'm already uh, 10 minutes over uh, what I said I was going to do. So let me... Um, 9.17 p.m. Yeah, very... Uh, oh, geez. Nick's sticking around. All right, fine. Here we go, guys. All right. Special sneak peek, all right, of some of the things that I'm working on. No promise on timelines. These are very, very rough, okay? So they're ideas, um, and unfortunately, I have a ton of stuff going on right now, so to be able to bring these ideas to fruition is going to take me time. So I wouldn't expect to see anything for probably three or four months on this, but it depends on how much it drives me nuts. Let me just go into my options monkey for a second, and I'm gonna turn on uh, two of the uh, data, or um, two of the different features that I'm working on. I'm not gonna show you the other ones that are in the list. So I have a feature here called parameter monkey. Um, the idea behind Parameter Monkey, if I can just load this one up, uh, it is running a query behind the scenes to query the metadata and actually bring things over. And what you can see here is that I've got a Parameter Monkey is empty. What Parameter Monkey 
three months. I have a 14 hour flight. Yeah, dude, I'm going to sleep on my flight. Um, maybe not for the whole 14 hours, but, um, but it's hard to code when you're offline. Uh, so here's the thing. What is Parameter Monkey about? Parameter Monkey is built around the issue that it drives. Actually, let me go back and um, let me see if I can find a file that actually has a parameter set up in it. Uh, you know what? I'm going to make this real easy. Let me just go file, close, file, close. There we go. Don't let's go start with a blank workbook here. New blank workbook. We're going to go get data from file, from folder, from folder. There it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop this in here and that folder is good enough. Actually, let's go grab CSVs. Okay. So, um, so here's what's going to happen with this one here is I'm just going to make this super, super simple along the way. We're going to go and say, this is my files list. Let me get this out of the way. I don't have any scripted demo for this, just so you know. So this is uh, where this one's going to be a little bit weird. Um, this one here is, I'm just going to call this output. There we are. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and say, let's combine all files from folder because I know this is going to create me something that actually has a uh, parameter in it. Okay, so we've got something here now that generates uh, a sample file and a parameter one. One of the things that's always driven me absolutely mental about this is that the manage parameters button is right here. So if I decide that I want to create myself a new parameter called file path that goes to this particular piece, I have to open up Power Query in order to make that happen. Okay, that's fine. But the problem is if I wanna change it later, I also have to open Power Query to change it. This is the thing that drives me a bit nuts. So I'm gonna go and close this for a second here and I'll just load this to uh, a worksheet because it always feels better to actually have some data. So there we go. So what Parameter Monkey is actually about is it the idea here is that we can actually load Parameter Monkey and once it loads, there we go, we can see we've got parameter one. So right inside here from Excel without actually opening up Power Query, my idea is that, hey, look, I can actually go in and actually start working with this stuff. So if I wanna create a new parameter called uh, file path and give it a current value of this particular piece, so let me get rid of those quotes, I want to be able to create it. This is the challenge that I'm struggling with on this one and why this one actually hasn't come out to fruition yet is because for some reason, Power Query sees this as a text string, which is a little bit weird because if we actually go into, um, into Power Query and we take a look at this thing here and we look at the advanced editor, all of the data that's in here is absolutely accurate for creating a parameter. So if I go and hit done on this, it turns it into a parameter. This is a little bit frustrating, okay? So the idea here that I was trying to get to is I want to be able to modify my queries. Let me go back into this one here. Let's call this file path. Close and load. Everything should still work. I should be able to refresh without any issues. Okay, everything works fine. But what I want to do now is I want to say, look, I want to change that file path. I want to do something different. Of course, it's going to blow up the query because I don't have the CSVs over there. But the idea is that you should be able to open parameter qu uh, query right from Excel without ever having to open up Power Query at all. And you should be able to go in and actually change the current value right here to say, oh, this wasn't CSVs, this was something else and go and hit update. So I need to work out why or figure out a reason why when I actually write this back, it is not interpreting it correctly as a parameter. As soon as you open the workbook again, it's fine. Okay, but that's why this one hasn't seen the light of day yet. Um, but it is something that I run with on my ribbon because for existing parameters, changing them right from Excel is much, much easier. Okay, so that's one. Let me go and say file close. The next one here is very rough, very rough, but something I've wanted to do for a long time. It's called BiblioMonkey. For those of you who don't know, Biblio is, I believe it's a Latin term for library. And the concept behind this is that I am trying to build myself a library where I can store my most useful power queries. Okay, so um, I can't actually, well, actually I can do all these. Hold on a second here. Let me just go and, uh, eh, no, I'm just not going to show you that one. But um, recently I posted something about Spotify. 
Okay, so um, and Nick is uh, Nick is here, and Nick was super excited about this because Nick was actually trying to solve this issue a couple of years ago and wasn't getting any headway. And uh, and for whatever reason, I needed to do something in order to uh, um, solve something for my daughter. Tripped on Nick's post and went, "That guy looks familiar," and noticed that there were two posts on the internet about how do I connect to Spotify, and both of them either had unsatisfactory or non-answers. So I ended up going back and actually building something mainly to help my daughter with her stuff, but I also knew that Nick was going to like this. So um, what this is, is basically I've actually taken the queries that I actually need in order to deal with this thing, and I've actually added them into my library. Now, the things that aren't working, uh, the update button, the eject button, all these things aren't working. So I'm just sort of getting there conceptually. But the idea that I'm looking for here is that what I'm after is when you're in a workbook and you've got a list of power queries, if you want to use one or you want to save it for next time around, I want something right inside Query Sleuth where you can right click and say, write this into BiblioMonkey. And it'll actually store it here. Okay, so the idea here is that I will then be able to come back and say, I want this one injected into the workbook. And it would just add it directly into the workbook. But while I'm here, why would I just do queries? Why wouldn't I also do DAX? and save DAX measures. Now, these are pretty simple DAX measures as well. Yeah, um, exactly, Nick, you got a bunch of text files. This is exactly the problem that I'm trying to solve here is why would I want a bunch of text files? I wanna have this all in one place. I mean, it just makes sense, right? So, you know, but again, I mean, why would I wanna do just queries? I mean, why don't we do DAX? Uh, why don't we do Excel formulas? Why don't we do VBA? Why don't we do Office scripts? Now, there's a lot of things here. When this eventually comes out, um, Office scripts and VBA will probably be disabled because uh, I'm concerned about the inject button around those things. Um, I need to enable certain things that I don't necessarily think that we need to be enabled. So I've got to figure out how to deal with some of these. But the idea here is that this will give you a central library where you can store all of your most um, you know, useful and interesting pieces. Uh, for example, I mean, this is something that I actually use to connect to SkillWave in order to go and actually read our data um, for different things. This is my, my core uh, piece here. And if I'm looking for orders, this is the, the, um, the format that I actually need in order to, uh, to be able to connect to um, that particular setup. So I never remember this. I've got it scattered through different workbooks. I don't like using text files for this. So I want it stored in one place so that I can just grab it and say, there we go. Uh, I can tell you that the update button works. I use this very heavily as I was writing my blog posts and uh, and Nick um, you know, was pointing out to me that I made mistakes. So I had to update this thing and, uh, and save things and, and whatnot. Uh, where is it going to be saved? Uh, that is a good question. Um, this is something that I have an answer for. Uh, I am just trying to remember where I've actually got it on this one. And I don't think I've got it exposed in the user interface. Um, but the idea is that it will be saved on your local PC. I'm not going to be pushing this out to the cloud, uh, at least not yet. Um, you know, it's something that I would need to, well, actually, let me ask you this, Fernando, where would you want it saved? I guess that's the, the, the biggest question here, right? I mean, you know, it's going to take me a lot more time to develop something that would be saved to, say, Azure SQL, and you would need to have your own Azure SQL database. Um, OneDrive, okay, so OneDrive is easy, right? Because uh, OneDrive, we can just put in the web link to the uh, to the database, or we can just save it to the local copy. Generally, I'd save it to a local copy and just have it in a sync file is, is what my sort of um, feeling is uh, for that problem. Uh, I did investigate using GitHub. Um, as a, as a back end, I, we put a lot of time into that and finally decided that that wasn't viable for what we wanted to do. Um, so we kind of gave up on that and we, uh, we actually have a, a local, um, MDB sort of access database, uh, that we're storing locally, but, uh, I just need to, um, yeah, GitHub just, I, like I say, I just don't know. I, I know enough GitHub to know how to actually write my stuff back, um, for, uh, for failovers and, and, um, and for recovery and checking in and checking out documents for managing the monkey tool software. But as far as GitHub gists and things like that, I don't know enough. Like I say, we invested a bunch of time there and finally decided it just wasn't viable for what we uh, what we needed to do. Uh, I was really concerned about the the management just on you know um, conflicts and things like that uh, along the way. So um, similar to storage for UDF and personal workbook templates. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the the I guess my sort of feeling is, I mean, what what I think you should have the ability to do if I'm actually storing um, storing information there is that inside the options monkey, I believe that there should be something that's set up to say, you tell me where you want to store the document uh, or sort of where you want to store the database. Because the other side, of course, of this thing here is that I, you know, I work across two different laptops, right? I mean, I've got the the laptop that usually sits on my desk down here, which is 
highly powered for doing all the things that I need to do and producing videos. But when I'm actually going for a training session, I actually take an X1 carbon, which is much more lightweight. Well, I got to think that I'm going to want all of my stuff in, in both places. So for me, this is where I'm thinking I'll write my database to a OneDrive folder and let it sync. Um, but you know, then the question comes down, should we be trying to write directly to the version that's on the internet? Uh, do I need to be worried about login, log out, things like that, or, or credentials and stuff? So we're still experimenting. As I say, this is why this is not out there yet. Um, I may release a first version that has, um, you know, that has uh, just a local file there with a, a configurable local file path and then sort of explore it from there. Um, we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm down to me being the sole developer on this. So, um, you know, I got to uh, keep that in mind as I'm trying to do things with all the other wonderful things that, uh, that I do here as, as well. So um, tablet editor macros are saved in the local PC. I mean, that makes sense, right? I mean, it, it uh, I think is, is probably the, the most logical place to, to sort of see that. So, so those are a couple of the things that I'm looking at and working on. Um, as I say, the, the parameter monkey, unfortunately, is virtually finished just with that one little bug. Uh, I'd love to get that sucker out, um, but I'm just a little concerned on how people are going to react to that if it doesn't look like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. The options monkey is going to take me a lot more time as I, as I work through and, and try and deal with all of those, or sorry, the uh, biblio monkey. It's going to take me a lot more time as I sort of work through and, and try and deal with those nuances and, and whatnot. So, um, all right, well, on that note, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go and uh, resume my uh, my screen share um, with the uh, with the closeout um, piece here. Uh, so if you're looking for resources on Monkey Tools, um, the best place to go and find them is at monkeytools.ca. Um, if you're looking for me, you can find me at XL Guru, you can find me at Skillwave, you can find me at Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all these wonderful places. I'm pretty sure we all know where you can find me. But I hope that um, in the grand scheme of things, you, this has been um, it has been interesting and and sort of you know enlightening and showed you some some cool stuff. Uh, I would remind you if you haven't played with this yet that uh, Monkey Tools it does have a free trial or you can download the free version right from the Monkey Tools website. Uh, the nice thing about this one here is that if you do decide to do the free trial, uh, there is um, there's no credit card that's required for this thing uh, at all. And uh, once the trial expires, if you decide not to buy it, it actually just reverts to the free version. So there's nothing extra that has to be done on that case there. And if you do decide you like it, well, there you go. You can actually uh, you can kick in and you can help us uh, support our development and uh, and unlock all the great features that you actually have uh, along the way as well. So, um, again, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it, and um, I think we'll uh, we'll sign off for now, and um, we'll catch you at the next meetup. So, thanks again. <laughs>